Kia ora. In this video we're going to continue talking about pressure and we're going to discuss a couple of ways of measuring it because it's all very well doing these thought experiments and things to work out what pressures are but it'd be good if we had some means of actually measuring pressures and the hydrostatic equation basically gives us a way of doing this. So we're going to start by sort of the most classical way of measuring atmospheric pressure which is the barometer. Now it's kind of terrifying, uh, you don't want to ever try and do this yourself, not that you should be able to because you should not be able to get the mercury, but it was invented in the 17th century by Torricelli. The idea is you take a big long test tube type thing, so it's closed at the bottom and open at the top, you completely brimful it with mercury, and then what we're going to do is we're going to, yeah I know mercury, they didn't know it was bad for you, um, you stick your thumb over the end or seal that end up, now that's once you've filled it up, then you flip it upside down and plunge it into a dish full of more mercury. Okay, now you might have had this like this thing before where you have a glass of water and you tip it outside, uh, upside down, put it on a table, um, because you basically end up forming a vacuum in the top here as this weight of mercury pulls down, that um, the pressure of the atmosphere that bears down on the rest of it kind of stops it from all just rushing out unless some air can get in somehow. So mercury has a weight to it so it's pulling down. Um, that means that's why this little vacuum develops at the top of the tube. The, essentially we're at zero pressure in that little glass bubble, in that little open bubble at the top there. Um, it's not 100% correct because uh, some of the mercury will turn into vapour um, and will increase the pressure slightly, but essentially we've got a vacuum or zero pressure inside the tube at this point. We also have atmospheric pressure on the surface at the bottom of the dish. Um, so that gives us the classic easy way of applying a hydrostatic equation to understand the difference here. So let's see if we can do some calculations and figure out uh, how we could measure the atmospheric pressure using this device. So one thing we can measure easily is the height. We can get a ruler out and measure what this height is. Okay, so hydrostatic equation tells us that P is equal to P naught. Um, that's just the, the, top, the top pressure, whatever that is. In our particular case, it's going to be zero um, plus rho g h. So if we apply this equation, we will get that our pressure, which is which is what we want to know, we want to take a measurement of the atmospheric pressure in this particular moment, we want to know what the weather's doing or something. Um, atmospheric pressure is going to equal the pressure at the, at, at the top, which is zero, so I'll just write that in as zero directly, plus the density of mercury, remember it's the density of whatever liquid we're dealing with, times g times the height we read off. So that will be rho mercury times g times our height. Okay, and that gives us a way of figuring out what the pressure is. So if, um, let's just say the atmospheric pressure is equal to 101.3 kilopascals. So let's just say we've got the standard atmospheric pressure. Um, how tall does this uh, barometer have to be uh, in order to, to make this measurement? Well, we go, okay, cool, that's fine. Um, if we rearrange our equation, we'll get h will be 101.3, just uh, divided by density times g, this is times 10 to the 3 because it's kilopascals, is going to be 101.3 times 10 to the 3 divided by 13546 times 9.8, which equals... Well, you do the calculation, you'll find that is about 0 0.76 meters or 760 millimeters. Just a little bit, little bit less than a meter tall if you're going to make a barometer this way. Uh, this is why we want to use something really dense like mercury to build one of these. If we tried to use water, the density of water is 1,000, not 13,000, and so our barometer would have to be way, way taller in order for this to work. That's why mercury is kind of ideally su uh, suited to this, because it's an extremely dense um, liquid. Uh, so funnily enough, um, people measure pressures in millimeters of mercury for this very reason, which is kind of weird. Uh, it's kind of crazy. So let's just write down a little bit about that. So alternative unit, I've run out of space, I'll go up here. Um, um, 760 
millimeters of mercury and so some pressures will be specified as millimeters of mercury particularly in the medical world um, that's defined to be one atmosphere which is that 101325 pascals we mentioned earlier so if you've come across a pressure specified as millimeters of mercury that's how you convert it into our standard units of pascals and for example, your blood pressure, um, if you get your blood pressure taken, 120 over 70 or whatever, those units are millimetres of mercury. So to turn them into pascals, you have to use this conversion. Okay, so our barometer gives us a way of measuring the absolute pressure of the atmosphere, for example. If you want to measure the pressure of something else, um, quite often we don't, we don't actually care about what the absolute pressure of something is but we care about how big it is relative to atmospheric pressure. Um, so for example, if you fill a balloon up, um, the, actual num the actual pressure number, 10 whatever it is happens to be, is not really that relevant because there's a countering atmospheric pressure on the outside. What's interesting is how much bigger the pressure is inside than atmospheric. So when we are doing this, we call that a gauge pressure when we take the pressure minus the current atmosphere. It doesn't even matter what the atmospheric pressure is, if it's varying or whatever. Um, the gauge pressure is just how much bigger or smaller our pressure is than that. Okay, and the device that tells this uh, to us is called a manometer. And again, here's a very sort of simple example of how this would work. So we've got a closed tube and it's got a bulb on top that's also enclosed with the unknown pressure inside it. And um, we'll see an example of where you do this in a minute. That might be, for, for example, you may have attached this to your bike tire. Um, and then you've got the other air is open to the atmosphere. So our hydrostatic equation tells us that the pressure P inside this bulb is also the pressure at this point here. Is also P. And our hydrostatic equation says that P is equal to our surface pressure plus the density of our fluid times gravity times the height difference. Now we don't know what the atmospheric pressure is, but what, if we rearrange our equation just slightly, we see that our gauge pressure is just rho gh. So a device like this can tell us the difference between the pressure of the thing we're trying to measure and atmospheric pressure, and that is what we call a gauge pressure. So whenever you're working on a problem involving pressures, you need to be clear on whether you're working with a gauge pressure, which will be what the majority of real world measurements of things that you take is, or whether it's an absolute pressure, which is just kind of like a big number relative to, uh, kind of near atmospheric pressure. Okay, um, so let's look at one more example using a manometer. So reasonable chance at some point in your life you've had your blood pressure taken, um, and this is kind of the setup. So there is a cuff that goes around your arm and you'll notice it's kind of at the same height as your heart. This is because if you take the pressure down here, you're going to get a number that's too big because it's going to be, using the hydrostatic equation, it's going to be sort of that much too far down and it's going to add on extra due to the density of your blood. So it's important when you're taking blood pressure that you try and use a part of your body that's at the same height as your heart is and so it's kind of targeting the brachial artery in your arm here. So you've got this little squeezy bulb that, which increases the pressure in the cuff and that's also the pressure that's in this sort of empty part of our manometer here. Now there are slightly more sophisticated ways of actually building one of these but in principle it works kind of like this. So you've got the same pressure kind of occurring throughout, so that with the pressure in the cuff, also the pressure in this tube, and the pressure in the, the bulb. The bulb has a valve in it, every time you squeeze it, it, puts, it brings in, sucks in some more air from the outside, and then doesn't let it out again, so it's got a valve. All right, so you've, this is called, by the way, a sphygmomanometer, which I think is one of the cooler words you're going to come across um, in this course. Um, right, so basically what happens is we inflate the cuff, keeps in getting bigger and bigger and bigger, until at some point, imagine your sort of artery it's at some sort of, it's pressurized relative to outside, right? The cuff is surrounding this, well, so it's surrounding your arm, but it, it kind of is bearing down on your artery as well. Um, so here's kind of the cuff wrapping around your artery. What happens is if the pressure gets high enough, what that does to your artery is it ends up collapsing it. Um, 
which is a little bit drastic, but hey, that's what happens. And what happens when you collapse an artery is that it no longer flows, okay? Um, so once you get the pressure high enough, when you exceed the pressure, the blood pressure inside the artery, that's going to collapse it. Um, and there'll be no blood flowing in your arm at that point. This is kind of how a tourniquet works as well. If you're trying to sort of cut off blood flow to stop someone from uh, losing a lot of blood. So what you then do is you get a stethoscope out um, and you listen for the change in sound as you gradually release the pressure and the blood starts flowing again. So you release, use a little valve to slowly release some of that pressure from the cuff. Um, and at some point your pressure goes just below the point at which the blood can start flowing again. Now the pressure inside your artery actually doesn't stay the same the whole time. It goes up and down. Uh, up and You may have seen a sort of a cardiac reading. It's like that. So the, at the peak of the blood of the cardiac cycle, your pressure kind of looks a bit like this, right? And then does it again and again and again. So this is the highest pressure part of the cycle, which is called systole. Um, and at that point, when you've released just enough pressure, just a little bit of blood will flow just when it gets to this, this degree of pressure. And you can, if you're trained, you can hear this through the stethoscope, and that's your systolic pressure. And then you continue to release more and more pressure, you'll feel the cuff gets less tight, um, until you can't hear any blockage at all, which is basically when all of the blood is flowing through, and that's called diastole. So those two pressures are what gets reported to you. So you get a systolic over diastolic pressure reading, um, e.g. 120 over 70, um, and that's in millimeters of mercury. So it's telling you the upper limit of blood pressure and the lower limit of your blood pressure um, during your cardiac cycle. Um, and yeah, like that's in millimeters of mercury, the same unit as before. So if you convert that into pascals, that would be about 16,000 over 9,000 pascals or thereabouts. Okay, so that kind of concludes our discussion on the hydrostatic equation and how we measure pressure. Uh, in our next video, we're going to look at buoyancy, which is another interesting side effect of hydrostatic equation um, or of hydrostatics, which is that objects that are less dense tend to float and objects that are more dense than the liquid they're in tend to sink. So we'll see you next time to talk about that.